part with Chuck Fothergill in fly fishing? <clears throat> I mean, it did it's, for me. No, I, I, no, I, I, yeah, he, he was a big part of it. But what happened was I was riding my bike to baseball practice one day and I saw this fly line horizontally going back and forth. There's somebody who's throwing this string and I rode over there. It was a very famous man by the name of Ernie Schwieber. Uh-huh. In the world of freshwater fishing, he had written the book Nymphs and Matching the Hatch. And, oh, yeah. And he was a, a big deal. So he taught me how to fly cast. And then Chuck Fothergill taught myself and the Wright brothers um, and, and Craig Ward how to tie flies. And then pretty soon we're tying flies for the shop. And that's how I was making my allowance by tying flies. That's awesome. Right? <laughs> and so then I became a part time guide. And then when I was traveling in Europe, in the fall to go train in Hintertux, Austria, I always had a fly rod in my bag. So everywhere we went, there was a um, there was a creek, a little stream somewhere, and I was always fishing in the afternoons. Wow! So you and got so to now, you got to fish I, around the world from world. Yes. So you now <laughs> now I'm catching these giant fish and getting paid a lot of money to go catch these great fish with all these guides. That's awesome. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, then I end up fishing the, all these big tournaments, and uh, I didn't win the gold medal in skiing, but I won the gold medal on fly fishing. You know, the, gold, the gold cup in these big tournaments. I won 12 tarpon tournaments, which is more more than anyone. Wow. I was the first angler to win a, 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 uh, a bonefish permit and tarpon tournament. Is- there's, only, there's only three of us that have ever done that. Now, is there a trick in that? Like for, for fish in the river, I can see where the water comes in and there's like different things you can look for to kind of give you an edge on that kind of stuff. But when you do <coughs> the tarpon stuff, <coughs> is there stuff that you, that your native uh, fisherman skills kind of look for? You know what no. I mean? No, it's a completely different world. And, and and here's the deal, and it goes for all fishermen everywhere. Good fishermen can catch a fish that, uh, a good fisherman can catch a lot of fish and big fish. A great fisherman can catch the fish that doesn't want to be caught. Right. And in the ocean, you got to have a guide who can not only be good and find a lot of fish, you got to have a great guide. A great guide is a guide who can find the fish that doesn't want to be found. Right. Now right. you got to remember, we're fishing, we're hunting these fish. So we we never even throw the fly until we see the fish in the water. Right. So right. we're in shallow water basins, we're on an edge where the fish swim, you know, over the white sand on the ocean. Mm-hmm. And then by the things that we do, the way that, the, I, I have to know where to put that fly in order to have that fish intercept my fly. And when he first sees my fly, I might do one thing or he might do something. And depending on what that fish does, I do something else. So it's like a dance. Right. You do this dance. I move my fly this way. Oh, you like that? Well, how about this? You move it this way. You slide a little bit, you bump, bump, and pretty soon the 150 pound fish goes whammo and eats your fly. Right. Right. That's what tarpon fishing is all about. It's this dance between your feathers and how you make this fly move and that and that fish because during the daytime that fish is not feeding right he's just traveling between bridges these big fish uh, eat at night right when uh when the bait fish comes swimming under a bridge and they're there waiting for these bait fish during the day they're not feeding they're just kind of moving but with a fly rod you can entice that bite you can enforce that fish to bite your bug right right so it is a bit of a, <laughs> a an old man in the sea thing a battle of the uh, <clears throat> the game of the the yeah the look look how do you catch a 150 pound fish on 16 pound test tippet with a fly rod how yeah. do you catch a blue marlin on a fly rod right right you know, so then you have to understand the skills of how to fight a fish right on tackle you right. know not pull too hard and break him off right. right you know and you also learn what the fish doesn't like when you're trying to catch him he turns his head this way i, I can pull my rod this way or that way and a lot of people, when you say pull harder, what do they do? They raise the, the rod higher. 
So that means they're trying to pull and fight everything with their the weakest part of their body, their bicep. Right, right. So right. To, to pull harder, you keep the rod straight and you pull, you hang onto the fly line and, and move your body back and lift with your legs. Right, right, right. You pull with your back, not your arms. Right. So there's so many tricks of the trade, you know. It's just like setting up and, and, and uh, how do you win in downhill? Right. You know, your aerodynamics have got to be better. You know, you've got to ride a flatter ski. You have to know how to how to hang into that turn and move to the inside, you know, with your body moving, you know, with hip angulation and, and slowly tip that ski up on an edge. Yeah. All of these small <laughs> little pieces of the puzzle end up, you know, paying huge dividends on the back end of it. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is, it's, I feel like um, it's interesting to hear you talk about the fishing because I feel like there's such a tie-in between what you've got from skiing and what you how what you how you've fashioned it into fishing. Um, I mean, I, th I feel like that's another thing that's going to be interesting because right now with this podcast, what I'm doing is getting talking to people like you who are a little older than my group, the people who kind of were involved with shaping the town of what I knew of Aspen. And then season two is gonna be my friends that I grew up with, kids within the first, you know, couple years, you know, four years of my high school stuff. And just interview and see where they are, what they're up to, you know? And I feel like it's interesting because everybody, you have an idea of what you're doing, especially when you're that little kid up on the mountain, <laughs> you know, and then life takes you through all these different turns. And I feel like that's the most interesting thing about life is that you can have these ideas of what you, what you're, where you're going to go. And it doesn't always turn out that way. Well, know? also too, let's not forget, you can get stuck. Yeah. You yeah. can get stuck and there's no way out. Yeah. Like, I was very lucky because I was in the broadcasting world and I had hosted some outdoor programming for the Outdoor Life Network that didn't, wasn't even fishing related. And they liked my work and they said, well, we need a fishing show. The network was in its infancy. They needed to get a high end produced fishing show to show the advertisers what that whole network was going to stand be be all about, right. you know, just by chance, they hired me to go fishing. And they had the money to pay me a lot in order for me to leave skiing. It was going to take a lot because I was making a lot of money. Sure, I wanted to go fishing, but if they didn't have the money to pay me, I was never going to be able to go down that road. Right, right, right. But and the in only way, the only way to get out of the hole is to be really good at what you're doing. Right. To be able to refine whatever you're doing and to be the best best at what you do so let's just say you you know you start out as a dishwasher then you're a waiter then you learn about cooking and whatever and then pretty soon you're in the back room and eventually you might own that restaurant a yeah. lot of people that own businesses start out by sweeping that floor but if you're not the best floor sweeper on the planet they're never going to give you a chance to have that job in that next tier that's exactly it. So uh, Barkley Dodge, kid that I grew up with, um, I, I think he was like a year below me in high school. He got his first job working at Bonnie's um, lot, restaurant up, up on the ski slope. Now he owns what used to be the Plaid Pantry. It's his restaurant. There you go. Got a Michelin star. And it's like, you know, here he was cleaning dishes and doing sous chef. And now he's got his own restaurant with a Michelin star. And it's like you said, if you have a dream and you grab onto it, just do it. Focus, you know, and you'll get a Michelin star, you know. Um, okay, so you didn't get gold, but boy, man, in that time, America was not even ranked in skiing. And all of a sudden, we were now in the hunt, you know. And it, you were part of that early stage of getting Americans into uh, the rankings, you know? Well, look, you know, I, when I finished sixth in 76, that was the second best finish by an American in the Olympics, in yeah. the Olympic downhill. Yeah. And since then, Billy Johnson won gold. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, Tommy Moe won gold. You know, there's a bunch of athletes that really started to perform at a high level. And then there's a period of time where Darren Rawls, there are a lot of guys that really did well. The, the Mayer brothers, yeah. you know, with, with, with what they did in slalom and giant slalom, they own the sport. Yeah. 
You know, Phil won. Here's an amazing story. Phil Mayer broke his ankle in the pre-Olympics in Lake Placid. So severely, Stedman said, he openly said at a press conference, I don't know if Phil can ski at a world-class level again. And Phil Mayer said, well, we'll see about that. The next year, Phil Mayer got a, 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 a silver medal in the slalom. He, he got second in Denmark. Then he went on to win three World Cup titles. Right, right. I remember. He won the gold in Sarajevo. Yeah. So Phil Mayer's heart was bigger than the injury he sustained. Right. Yeah. It, it comes down to, you know, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight the in dog. that dog.